right, what's going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of Bro History. It's Henry Zamoda, Danny Abdeljabar. What's up, man? How are you holding up, brother? I am alive, I am healthy, and I am thriving. How about you? Um, well, I wish I could say the same. I don't have the coronavirus. However, I think I made myself sick because I'm forced to eat my own cooking, my own cooking all day. <laughs> yeah. Is it just me or do you feel like you're doing dishes a lot more? Well, yeah, we're home more. So naturally you're going to do more dish- dishes. But yeah, um, I've been just doing a lot more cooking and I'm not a bad cook or anything like that. I'm no expert by any means, but I'm decent. However, um, in, you know, in my neighborhood, there was a, a two-day period where it was pretty hard to come by groceries, if you know what I mean. So I resorted to a very shady, suspicious grocery store, and I got a bunch of chicken. And, well, would you ever expect that chicken not to be the best quality chicken in the world? Where'd you get it? Some random bodega? Yeah, some random bodega. And um, it was gross. My apartment, I mean, we're we're not quarantined right now. We're, we're recording this in, in New York city today. Um, and, um, uh, we're not quarantined or we're not shut down. We're like, qua- no, no shelter in place yet. There is a, um, <clears throat> there's kind of a, I guess a mini kind of conflict between de Blasio is what, and, uh, and Cuomo right now where de Blasio is more in favor of taking more extreme measures like a shelter in place. And Cuomo is uh not not uh he doesn't really want to take that he's not having that he's saying that's a state decision not a city decision um it's politics as usual between cuomo and, and bill de blasio which who, who don't like each other uh, at all but essentially most people are staying at home like there's not that many people out in the street right now i was in central park today and uh that's the only time i go outside is when i, I go to central park um, just to work out, like I'll take a take, walk. Yeah, I'll take a walk. I'll take. I'll go for a run. Um, I found a hill to do sprints up, and just like random stuff, to like just to just to act like I'm going to the gym. So I'll like bring weights to the park. Like I'll I'll bring plates to the park, and um, I'll just like run up the hill with the plates in my hand and, and stuff like that. Uh, really anything to stay active at this point. But uh, my apartment smells like perpetual farts because i'm always here it's just perpetual fart smelling all day and it's getting it's getting it's getting musky in here i think i'm at a way greater risk of getting sick from like my own my own gas than than anything such as coronavirus but um if you guys haven't guessed at this episode we're just kind of going with the flow right now. Um, oddly enough, Danny and I have both been pretty busy. That's why this episode's coming out a day late, just doing work from home and, and things like that. And um, we, we couldn't get an episode out yesterday. And everything with coronavirus right now, obviously, it's a pretty big deal. And if you're listening to this, I'm sure it's affecting you, affect, affecting you in, in your own way, uh, whether you live in New York, which a lot of our audience is from, or... Or California or Texas, uh, it, our audience is pretty diverse as far as like the the concentration per state per state, or Canada or or even Europe. I'm sure you're all uh, dealing with it in Australia as well. But it's pretty. If you ever look at our download numbers, it's pretty. Uh, it's a pretty diverse range of people. New York being the highest, but I just think it's because of the you know where that's where like the word of mouth started first. But. Um, Everyone's obviously dealing with it in their own way and, and has different circumstances and there's a level of shutdown and, and, and different state per state. However, um, it's it's uh, weird. It's pretty weird. It's super weird. And, and I, you know, I, what I wanted to talk about today, you know, I was interested to see if we can do an episode without actually talking about coronavirus in the main content of the episode. And that's probably impossible, but... I found a bunch of random articles uh, that I was reading that were like unrelated entirely to um, uh, coronavirus and some that were like loosely uh, related that you probably haven't heard of because coronavirus has been dominating the news lately. Uh, So figured maybe we could just read through some of them, you know, give our thoughts and theories and maybe give you guys something new to hear about instead of just, uh, you know, global pandemic. 
yeah, it's not healthy just um, obsessing over coronavirus all day, even though, I mean, it's the circumstances that we're living under right now. And things are going on so fast right now on the ground anyway. So it's like any show that we put out, if we were going to dedicate it to coronavirus, it's going to be irrelevant the next day. Like it, what we say today will not be relevant tomorrow regarding coronavirus. Um, so it's impossible to track. It's impossible to, to really even judge at this point. Uh, where we're at right now is, uh, is unexpected. Did you expect this to happen? Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, Did you, I felt like when no, we were last talk- week when we were recording our last episode, when we were talking about how it's affecting the oil markets, did you expect it to turn into what it is today? Yeah. Last it week, was a week sure. later. Yeah. Last week for sure. Um, but you know, a few months ago when we were initially talking about coronavirus, you know, I was exercising some caution. I was saying, Hey, you know, okay. You know, the virus so far doesn't sound like it's going to kill everybody, but like we should be careful because it is spreading really, really quickly. And, you know, I had, I had a, an idea that it would definitely come to the United States. Um, at that time, I didn't think that it was going to be as massive and sweeping as it is now. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's uh, 2020 for you, I guess. Right. Did you hear that ISIS put out a PSA not to go to Europe? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you were telling me about that. That's hilarious. Um, you were saying that like uh, they they put out that PSA don't go to the um, the EU and also wash your hands. <laughs> yeah, they they, Do they said have, like, don't a hand go. Don't. Tutorial? <laughs> I forgot their exact announcement, but I've they, they said something like don't go into the unho- the unholy plague ridden states of of Europe. Uh, you don't want to bring back the virus here and make sure you're taking precautions to to uh cleanse your like it said it said it in a way they like used a verse from the quran in mm-hmm. their psa it's like muhammad said that what they <laughs> that somebody that is cleansing it like it was you know they did it in their isis fashion but i found it pretty humorous that they're even making psa's about not traveling and not going places hey man uh, you want to you want if you want to fight for the jihad <laughs> you can't have the coronavirus you can't have the coronavirus with the jihad no i mean listen this is going to be the oddest thing to say, but I support them in that measure. You know, whatever we got to do to flatten the curve, even if it means ISIS has to put out a couple of PSAs on washing your hands. Cool. I guess. Um, I wouldn't be crying if everyone in ISIS got Corona. <laughs> I'll be completely honest. No, I, I wouldn't either. But, you know, they put everybody else at risk, which is kind of like the, the whole main issue with this coronavirus. It's not necessarily like, do you think you're going to die? You probably won't. Right. Especially if you're young and healthy. Um, even though there's some evidence coming out that even young people are get, are dying from it as well. Um, however, um, it's not necessarily about do you think you'll die, but more like are you going to be a carrier and be the result of why other people die, right? And so, you know, while, yeah, I agree, I wouldn't shed a tear about some ISIS member, you know, dying of the coronavirus, uh, I would take some, you know, pause if they were spreading it around either inadvertently or advertently because that wouldn't be good for anybody well they spread a lot more uh vicious and uh disgusting diseases around the middle east i'll tell you that but i mean the middle east has it pretty bad but not as bad as europe obviously not as bad as asia not as bad as central central asia and and iran um not as bad as italy last time i looked at the count um china still won i um Italy's two. I think Iran is three. Nope. Uh, I just oh. read something earlier today. Uh, Italy surpassed number of confirmed cases. Confirmed uh, cases. I, I know they they yeah. passed the death total, but I didn't know it was confirmed cases. Mm. In China? Oh, excuse me. Death toll. Yeah, you're right. So they, they, they surpassed the death toll of China, which, you know, to a certain extent is worse <laughs> than the confirmed cases. That means that they're, they're having a much harder time, you know, dealing with it. And, and their health system is having a much harder time dealing with it. Um, but yeah, you know, well, what, in New York, it doubled overnight. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah. We, we surpassed Washington, which was the first to like actually shut down, you know, um, quite, quite a bit ago, but, um, you know, that got me thinking to like this next topic that I wanted to talk about. That's kind of related to, to coronavirus, not entirely. And it was North Korea. Right. So I was thinking about like, 
okay, what's North Korea up to in this coronavirus times? Um, like, they're a hermit nation, right? They're they're blockaded off. They don't have like a whole extensive contact or travel or anything like that. You know, so I figured, hey, they they're probably a pretty good you know uh, case study to look into because you know people don't go there, uh, so that would minimize their risk. Um, and I just wanted to like look up and see what's North Korea up to. Evidently, uh, North Korea, you know, despite the entire world uh, continuing its war against the coronavirus, uh, North Korea, you know, is still keeping up its campaign against the uh, kingdom of Atlantis. Uh, they've fired uh, a ton of new rockets into the sea uh, in the last few weeks. Um, something like, uh, it was like 24 or 25 uh, different instances of uh, unidentified like rocket fire. Um, so they're testing their ICBMs, their intercontinental ballistic missiles. They traveled something like 124 miles and 31 miles in the sky, you know, so really high arcing, you know, they're, they're testing, um, you know, kind of their, their intercontinental ballistics missiles in that respect. And that got me thinking like, you know, are they okay? You know, like it's, it sounds like if, if they had the virus, they, they really wouldn't be prioritizing this, but you know, I guess at the same by the same token, maybe they're just doing this now while everyone's paying attention to coronavirus, you know? Um, and so I read also in a different article that, um, you know, evidently they say that they don't have any coronavirus at all and that they conquered it, you know, complete propaganda. Uh, so I found that pretty interesting, even though there's some unconformed reports of the coronavirus in North Korea and deaths, uh, and it's suspected that due to black market trading, um, that that's how they were getting it. Um, so what was interesting about that is that, uh, as you know, as I mentioned before, China, uh, North Korea doesn't have like any exclusive trading partners and things like that. So, uh, when you're closed off to the world, that opens up a whole lot of opportunities for the black market. Uh, and you know, they're closest like neighbor other than South Korea there, which they probably couldn't get away with a whole lot of black market trade there, uh, would be China. And China is the epicenter of the coronavirus. So, you know, that kind of turned my opinion on its head. Um, but yeah, it's pretty interesting stuff. Well, it makes sense strategically to start going with these ballistic missiles tests and, and all that, just because a lot of the world is occupied. So they won't be immediately condemned, but a lot of times when they do that, I I always kind of think that they they want the attention. You know, they want they want the U.S. to see that they're launching, um, you know, they're they're launching warheads into space and things like that. Because again, you know, we, we've talked about this a lot that you know North Korea. You know, my whole thing with them is that they make these weapons to more so to negotiate them away rather than to use them in battle or to actually, you know, use them against South Korea or, or Japan or wherever. Right. It seems like every time their their country is starving um, and they need some, some, you know, humanitarian relief, they yeah, say, that's hey, when we'll get rid of it. a couple of uh, ICBMs and you give us some rice or whatever the fuck they ask for. Because North Korea... They don't need nukes to take out millions in Seoul. Like, no. they don't need nukes. They have plenty they, of artillery. Yeah. They have, just with the conventional artillery that they got in, like, the 70s and 80s, they would be able to kill millions of people, and they'd be able to, to kill U.S. troops and in, 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 stationed in South Korea. Right, along that they have line, zone. They have lines of, of artillery that are about not really too far from the from the. The and they're border. all hidden. They're all and hidden they're, in the mountains. They're all. They're all. Shit, you know? They're. They're all hidden. But regardless of they're hidden or not, if they were to strike South Korea, or they were, to, if they were to strike the U.S. bases stationed around Seoul or Seoul itself, they'd be able to. T- they'd be able to kill a lot of people just with the conventional artillery alone. Yep. So that. Within so minutes. That, yep. And that it, within minutes, because mm-hmm. I mean, it, there's there's about fifteen thousand units or so stationed about. I guess 10 miles away from the border. Yeah, it, from it's that very, DMZ, it, right. 50, mm-hmm. 50, 50 to 10 miles. I, I forget the exact distance, but it's it's within range of Seoul. Well within range, yeah. It's well, mm-hmm. it's well within range. So they would be able to, to wreak havoc. They don't need the nuclear warheads. Like, right. obviously, that's a plus for your deterrent because there's there's a whole other level of, of risk there. And, and also, they're 
they launched Warhead into space. So it is possible that they would be able to to bomb the United States if it really came down to it. Well, um, probably they, Guam, they, maybe they te- Hawaii. They technically, you know? they technically could. They technically yeah. could. The, the U.S. may intercept it, but... It would be techni- a stretch, but they, they could. Like, best case scenario, they could. It would be a stretch, though. Um, it, but there's no joking around with that. Yeah, no, so, no. It, so, yeah, it also serves as a deterrent, but I think that is the leverage what they would rather negotiate away for some type of sanction relief and you saw that with the sunshine policy back in back in the 90s when clinton was president um when they were talking between um when when japan russia china the u.s and south korea were all were all in talks over uh de-escalating north korea the uh you know the denuclearizing North Korea and you know the plan was to give them sanction relief and the talks were going pretty well but what ended up happening what destroyed those talks between between uh North Korea was that was really Japan Japan was the one that that um left the left the negotiating table because they had found out that North Korea had captured citizens from Japan and killed them so during that nego- during while they were negotiating and they were like nope we're out we're we're done and the US followed as well. But that was the closest we ever really got if you want to add to um if you if you want to add to you know what Trump's negotiation which was going pretty well until mustachio John Bolton pretty much self-sabotaged it. Um but yeah North Korea doesn't need nuclear warheads to to, to destroy to just to, to wreak havoc. They they want to just they, they use that as a bargaining chip. But you know who knows? Maybe I, I I have zero clue. You know what is in the head of these people who run the foreign policy in North Korea? Like who who fucking knows? We we don't have access to them. They're not yeah, making everything they say is bullshit anyway. So <laughs> yeah, everything they say is bullshit anyway. But you have a sense that they do they are seeking they do want sanction relief, but at the same time they want to maintain that control. That really just kind of sick, uh, you know. Uh, best way to describe this is a communist fascist regime that they have going on there. They want to make they want to maintain that while while also getting sanction relief, and why why not just you know why not uh, ramp up the nuclear program to do that? Well, you know, they might not need nukes, but they do need hospitals. Uh, and this is another uh, interesting thing that I found out about North Korea. Apparently, Kim Jong-un ordered a new hospital built in North Korea in Pyongyang, their capital. And uh, a lot of people are talking about how this is, you know, they need it because of, like, coronavirus, right? Uh, But that's not what they're saying. Again, Oh, there's no fucking way they don't have the coronavirus, by the way. (laughs) There is absolutely (laughs) no chance. Not a chance. There's no chance. All right. You want to hear hear what they said, why they needed a new hospital in Pyongyang? He said, our party, uh, this is a direct quote here from their minister, uh, our, our party analyzed and assessed the present state of the public health service, medical service in the country, and feeling miserably self-critical of the fact that there is no perfect and modern medical service establishment, even in the capital city, discussed and decided on building in this year of the 75th anniversary of its founding a modern general hospital in first in Pyongyang for the promotion of people's health. Oh, that's nice of them. Cute. <laughs> very, very cute. It's probably a quarantine center. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude. I, I mean, like... Yeah. Uh, China can build hospitals immediately, right? They can build those mobile ones. We've seen them do it for the coronavirus. Yeah, this but sometimes China's forever. buildings fall. Uh, well, that's a different thing that I don't even want to get into. Uh, that was we a can talk about we can talk about conspiracies today. Why all not? Right, I feel like right, I feel like it's like perfect timing. I feel like it's perfect timing to to talk about conspiracies. Right, let's, let's, let's get in war mode right now. <laughs> Alex Jones shaved his head. He got a DUI recently. He's in war mode. <laughs> his mugshot. He's his big. His big old head is in the mugshot. Yeah, I guess we got to take. I'm over. in war mode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got to take over. <laughs> He's in war mode. <laughs> <laughs> all right, um, so all right, there was that hospital. So if, if you didn't hear this news, there was a hospital. Oh, excuse me, not a hospital. There was a hotel in China, in Guangzhou. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, that was being used as a 
like a medical observation facility that they were quarantining people in who had the coronavirus. And then it collapsed. And I don't mean like, you know, part of it, like a wall fell or some shit. I mean, like the whole fucking thing came down. And when it happened, I'm like trying to read about it. Like, was there an earthquake? You know, was there a gas explosion? Nothing. No information. To this day, I, I still haven't heard any update on like, why the fuck did that happen? And the conspiracy theory that's going around right now, and I will premise this as a conspiracy theory, is that China false flagged themselves and like blew it up or you know made it collapse on purpose to contain the spread of the virus in that one area. So that's that's that. Hey, I think you got to be an Occam's Razor type guy in this situation and assume that the building was just not properly constructed, which is very possible. It's China. See, for that same reason, I don't believe that. You know, they're but, pretty good at building shit. But at the same time, they are good at building stuff. Um, so I think I'm going to pull a Joe Rogan. It's entirely possible that this – that this uh, – that – Maybe, maybe they, they did do, they did uh, destroy that hospital in order to quarantine. But I mean, would that even be an effective measure to, to quarantine a virus there? Just, just like, just, I mean, essentially killing everyone there. Like would that, I guess that would, right? Because it's, I mean, what, maybe, how many, how many like, less people with the virus are going to spread it? Uh, maybe. I don't know, dude. Uh, this is, this is the problem that I have with this is that when I was, when it happened, I looked into it. I, did all the googling that i know how to do and i try to look at all the different times and news, news sources and all they were doing was just saying yeah some hospital some hotel just fell apart and then i tried it again a couple days later to see if maybe new information came out and i didn't see anything so like the fact that i'm not seeing anything about why the fuck did this thing fall you know like if you if you uh, for the listeners s send me an article <laughs> send us an article if you, if you find any additional information about this because i'm like super curious about it well, my mom called me up and she said that, you know, it was the Chinese that made this virus. Uh, That's why they arrested those doctors. Did you hear the, um, did you see that thing? There was this novelist, uh, the name is escaping me. There was a, a, a novelist who wrote a story a long time ago about, uh, it was just like a novel. And literally it was creepy as fuck because they basically predicted this, you know, Wuhan shit. It was like Nostradamus, you know, uh, prediction level. Um, but let me see if I can't pull it up because it was super interesting. I got, I found out about this at work and I could probably pull it up. Let's see. Nope. Taking too long. doesn't matter. Uh, anyway, so there was a, there was a novel that came out a while back and it specifically named the Wuhan province and it specifically named, you know, the fact that there is a, uh, like like a chemical factory outside of it that, that deals with like infectious diseases, like a biotech lab uh, that deals with infectious diseases, which is true. Uh, and that somehow it got out and, you know, caused a pandemic. It, it's funny because another thing that predicted this was that movie contagion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they predict that. Well, I mean, I guess the verdict's still out on how the virus was, virus was, was actually created, but they said a, a pig ate bat poop, and that's how it started. Mm -hmm. And that's what people are speculating, right? That's what the sci the scientific well, community that's what the scientific community is speculating, right? Yeah, I mean, it definitely it definitely came from bats. You know, I think that's 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 probably that's probably a done deal. Um, Here's my conspiracy theory: it's a leftover Japanese imperial Japanese chemical warfare research and development center. In China, in Munchuko. You do know that during World War II, during the Sino Japanese War, so even before like the main war broke out in 1939, they were building, they, they carved out a big piece of China and they called it Manchuko. And they, it was basically a puppet state for, for Japan and they were building um, weapons labs in there, like chemical weapons labs. Yeah, and they were doing chemical all... weapons and bio warfare. No, they were doing bio warfare, chemical weapons. They were doing everything. They were doing some intense research there. 
And Unit 731 was, they were kidnapping uh, Chinese citizens, they were kidnapping American POWs, British POWs, and they were doing experiments on them. So these experiments included like dissecting them, the, uh, freezing them. They were doing a lot of different studies on like the bubonic plague. They were doing studies on just uh, like anthrax and cholera and tuberculosis. And they were, the scientists involved, they were trying to blend these diseases together to create biological weapons. Now, that's a really stupid idea. Well, this was, this was going on during the war. And the guy who the, the guy who ran the lab, a lot of these got these scientists, and they were torturing people. You know, they were they were they were kidnapping them and dissecting them, and they were making them go through human experiments. Um, they were they were granted immunity. They weren't even they weren't tried for war crimes because the U.S. wanted that research. Oh, it's just like the uh, how they wanted the Nazis and their rocket people, like Werner von Braun. Yeah, exactly. So they gave they granted all those guys communities during uh, the communities. They they granted them immunity during the Tokyo War Crimes Tribunal, and these guys were monsters. Like they were complete monsters. They were kidnapping people and and playing playing doctor with them, but with a pinch of like infecting them with the bubonic plague. So my consp- my conspiracy theory is that it's an old Imperial Japanese research center. That somehow let out the virus. How how about them apples? You ever heard of, you ever heard it there? You ever heard it on Infowars yet? Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, obviously there is absolutely no evidence to support that, and it's likely not true. But it's fun playing these games. All right, let's. I let's... love. I I like far <laughs> off conspiracy. Sometimes like thinking about far off conspiracy theories are fun. You have to admit it. Yeah, but my far off conspiracy theories are like aliens and shit, not like shit that's like could maybe possibly be true. You know? Oh, so you're saying that someone's gonna dig into this and find out the truth that it was? Well, actually, if you ask Imperial, the ancient alien, it was the it was <laughs> Imperial Japan. <laughs> it was the Fuck. lizard. It was the lizard people, dude. They're they're the ones that created the coronavirus. I don't know. I'm sticking with the Japanese. I think I think we should blame them. Let's <laughs> sanction them. <laughs> no more Nintendos. You know what would happen. We can never sanction Japan. No, no. We America's our, America's gamers. Yeah. America's gamers would revolt. It'd be a revolution. Gaming revolution. What do you mean I can't play Final Fantasy Eleven? <laughs> Is that one even good? I I don't remember. Um <laughs> Speaking of Japanese, during my downtime I've been playing a lot of Donkey Kong. Oh. <laughs> 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 apparently xbox live um like uh users usership on a daily basis is spiked so like oh. everyone's sitting at home doing nothing but playing video games so and that's this is all right like i'm happy that i'm working in a job that's still going and and really helping out you know with this uh you know pandemic however i'm kind of jealous of the people that that you know, are gonna still be paid, but oh, also don't be that don't guy. Do that. <laughs> don't be that guy. A lot of people are using this as excuses to be lazy assholes. Yeah, that's true. That's like, true. Oh, I don't have to go to work. I'm just gonna masturbate 50 times a day now. <laughs> <laughs> like, how many people are probably doing that? Yeah, it's, at least one. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, I've, <laughs> I've got to see how many I can get. I'll go for the Guinness Bo- Guinness Book of World Record. Um, yeah, a lot of people are. Uh, listen, I'm not trying to downplay this but a lot of people are using this as an excuse to be fucking lazy like the people who have the option to work from home are sitting on their asses and they're fucking watching mari or whatever it's gone daytime television i'm assuming that they're watching they're binge they're binge watching like Steve you Wilkos know, or whatever his Witcher, name is. Yeah. <laughs> Witcher or whatever or whatever show that their friends have been recommending to them, the Steve, the Steve or um, Saved by the Bell used to always come up when I was home sick from school. I always used to watch Saved by the Bell during during when I was home, or Boy Meets World. They'd have they'd have like rerun episodes during the day on uh, on uh, Disney. I forget. That doesn't matter. However, a lot of people are using this to be lazy fucks. Yeah, if you and... if you're if you're working from home right now because you can, like let's all take this opportunity to like bust our ass so that all of the companies across the United States understand that working from home is totally fine so we can make this a thing even after 
um, coronavirus because it's nice to work from home when you when you can. Be in a, it's nice, but it's also, it's also a privilege. Like I, I don't want to sound like a fucking like a a stickler right now, but like there's studies there there's there's there, there's clear evidence that working from home is a lot less productive than working at an office, and. Yeah, I know there's people who who are mature enough and there's plenty of people who work from home full time and you know they do their work and they're able they have the maturity level to, to to do that. But a lot of fucks aren't used to it and it's um it's tough. I'm the less productive. I mean, I don't want to say that just in case one person's listening, but like I, I I have to really put my mind to being productive when I'm working from home. Um, because it's very easy to get distracted with, with television and, and all that. So turn that shit off and work. I'm actually the opposite. I'm, I'm, get more, back to I'm, work. More, I'm more productive at home because no one's around to bother me and ask me questions and shit. I mean, they still do like via Slack and shit, but you know, it's easier to like make them wait five minutes so I can finish what I'm doing rather than, you know, get interrupted and then have to start all over again. Um, but you know different strokes for different folks as they say well most people don't work from home and they're given this opportunity right now to do it and they've a lot of people have never really worked from home yeah. before so yeah, it's completely a it's a completely new experience they for them no idea yeah. so i don't i don't know if there's like kind of a mindset built in that oh i'm staying from home so this is vacation right now right uh, mm-hmm. i might as well uh I take might as nap. well take a nap. Oh, yeah. I guess lunch. Usually I t- take a 30-minute lunch, and I just grab a sandwich, and I eat it at my desk. But I think I'm going to take a two-hour nap today and watch uh, reruns of of uh, of uh, How I Met Your Mother. So, yeah, if, if you have the opportunity to work, a lot of people don't have the opportunity to work right now, and that totally sucks. And I feel really bad for the people who who literally have either service jobs or or jobs where they can they physically cannot work from home. I think that sucks if to be out of work. And and now there's going to be some stimulus package to bail people out. And thousand all that, bucks a month. A thousand bucks. Oh, Andrew Isn't Yang. That, Andrew Yang knew what he was and, talking and, about. And, Andrew Yang. <laughs> but you know that money is not free. Like. We're. This is money that is. This is. This is. This no, is we're taking on another trillion printed. dollars in, it's in just, debt. It's just. Yeah. It's taking on more debt. This is yeah. just more taxation in the future. Like this is not good. It's yeah. not good. To yeah, but have if we had a sustainable the, UBI, like, if we had a sustainable UBI system before this shit happened, then we wouldn't. It wouldn't. It'd be less of a problem, for sure, for a lot of people, millions of Americans. I don't understand how giving people a thousand dollars a month is good for the overall economy well it's certainly going to be like, good for the uh, overall money, economy money <laughs> earning earning money should be ba- based off what services and production that you provide for somebody else yeah what, yeah what, true service but... and production like this giving money away it, it incentivizes just nothing like, i mean i think I you're I think not we're entitled gonna... for for just free money Let, let's wait there until no after we get all this money. money back you know and see what happens you know with the markets and shit because frankly you know i it's a very it's very simple for me and this coronavirus is just highlighting it right obviously a pandemic has to come out for us to really like pay attention to it but you know the point though is i agree with you you know work should be rewarded and you know the value of money should you know be based on like your output but like frankly there are ways to get this done i mean you know for example zoltan uh who came on our show a little while ago he proposed like selling uh or leasing federal lands to pay for you know a ubi it's not necessarily about the the question is really about like how do you pay for it not necessarily should we do it in my opinion because the should we do it is like obvious to me right if it wasn't the coronavirus pandemic in the future it's the automation that you know basically removes the opportunity for people to work who want to work, you know? But most likely, if everyone's purchasing power goes up simultaneously, it's just going to end up... It's just going to cause prices to raise, that's, you know? That's that's not that's not true. That's that's not true. And, yeah, and shit, you know, we have... Let's wait. Let's wait a couple weeks, you know, um, and see what happens when, when we all get a thousand bucks. But, like... But just look, look at this, Matt. Look, look at this, like, micro example of, like, all right, living in New York City versus living in a place like Tennessee. Right. Um, mm-hmm. The the cost most people I'm not knocking on Tennessee or anything like that, right, but just most likely your right? salary will be a lot higher in New York in a job in New York City for the same versus the same job 
in Tennessee. I'm right. not out saying of, that there's a necessity. level of competence. Right. I'm not saying there's a level of competence. I'm just saying it's out of necessity you need to pay people more because the cost of living in New York City is outrageous. And the standard of living would be better. It may very well still be better in Tennessee. You may have a bomb ass house and be, be making not as you may not be making 150k a year but still have a bomb ass property and a bomb ass house meanwhile somebody in new york city is is I making mean, 150k th- is gonna like have a small it's not it's apartment. not really <laughs> even enough it's not enough to support a family in new york yeah, city no, it I can tell you that. no no so I would just I would expect if everyone's purchasing power went up, then I would not I, I I would expect prices to follow suit with that. Yeah, I mean, and and it would for very specific things. You know, it just all depends on supply and demand, right? So not not everything is going to go up. You know, so in New York City, the reason why cost of living is so high, uh, at least a part of it, is because there are so many people that live here and want to live here, but there are only so many places to live. Right. Uh, And so the demand is super high for housing and therefore the prices go higher because the demand is higher. But if we're talking about like like domestically across the board on all 50 states, you know, prices of, say, rent and like housing isn't going to go up across the board because everybody has more money. You know, the specific things will become more expensive depending on the demand in those areas. You know, like how right now the cost of fucking hand sanitizer shot up to like $200 a fucking bottle or some shit like that a little while ago. Um, Funny story about that. This dude uh, in Knoxville, Tennessee, uh, he actually ran around um, with his brother to a bunch of like counties and like went to like Dollar Generals and like shit like that and literally bought all of the hand sanitizer way back in like February and had been selling them on Amazon at like a ridiculous price profit and then amazon and ebay cut them off (laughs) and now they're sitting on like eighteen thousand bottles of this shit right um because they were abusing it um and well here's the thing about price gouging Mm -hmm. is that price gouging it limits scarcity like all right so i went to the store the other day and i'm not saying that you should be you should be a predator and do things like purchase everything and then sell a a bottle hand hand sanitizer for a hundred bucks like that's fucked up but it, it, scarcity does like that does limit scarcity if prices go up during times of crisis. I went over to yeah, if limits I, scarcity, if, but it doesn't. It but doesn't here's offer the thing: the, I, the, the, the it doesn't solve the the issue. Like if people need hand sanitizer or soap or like toilet paper or some shit like that, and we start gouging it, like yeah, less people are going to be able to afford it, but also more people are not going to have that because it's so, too expensive. <laughs> I went over so when I was grocery shopping every th- this weekend everyone was like I'm sure everyone experienced this in their own communities everyone was at the grocery store and they were you know you saw people fighting over toilet paper like um like this is a, a disease like diarrhea or something that's going to make you shit your brains out or <laughs> like someone didn't tell these people you saw that video right of the people fighting over toilet paper like like this is going to be one that makes you bleed out of your asshole. No, it's not. It's it's not. It's not that. <laughs> but at the store, I saw this lady. She purchased. She was purchased. She purchased all of the meat. Like all this. All <laughs> but that shit's of the go meat. Bad. Just all, she's going to freeze it, obviously. But just just all of the meat because the grocery store that I typically go to is not very high quality. <laughs> I'll be completely <laughs> honest. I went to a lesser quality one because of everything. But all of the meat. So she was able to get like uh, beef, uh, ground beef and ground turkey and ground and and Chicken like any and shit, any yeah. anything that wasn't like complete shit grade quality. Like the only things that were left were hot dogs. I've been living <laughs> off hot dogs for the past <laughs> fucking week. So, all, all and I see her checking out, and I'm like, well, you know, she's gonna buy as much as possible because they're fucking. It's like. For a pound, it's like six ninety nine or something like that. I don't know the exact price, but she she's purchased got 200 all of pounds it, of it. All, all of it, all of it, all of it gone. <laughs> if the prices went up, then that would prevent scare, like prevent people from hoarding resources like that, especially in like local communities like this, where you know some billionaire is not going to walk into the grocery store that I go to and start buying his meat there. Like, oh, I think I'll go to Food Universe and I'll start buying all that. Um, yeah, but the thing about that but is shit like, like, right, that, like that, like that, like that's it. Like, 
What if this woman just that, straight or, around, straight up hawking the meat outside now, right? Like she, she's she not, bought all the meat, selling then, it, <laughs> like selling it on the fucking street and shit. Because that's what people were doing with those like hand sanitizer and COVID nineteen masks and shit like that. Is is you know it's it's a balancing act. Yes, if it were, were more expensive, this woman would not be able to afford all of those. But you got to think of it on the low end of the spectrum. What about a poor family who could barely afford the six ninety nine a pound, and now it's ten ninety nine a pound or twenty dollars a pound? right because of to to prevent um scarcity and now they can't afford it at all you know and that that's that's a problem and that's you know coming back to the stimulus thing you know like finally like left right and center everybody's like all right fuck it let's give everybody cash because that's the only thing that's going to help us through this and yeah we're going to borrow it and yeah we're going to have a lot of debt and we're probably going to end up having more taxes at some point you know to pay down that debt but they saw it as an absolute necessity because if we don't, then nobody has money, nobody has purchasing power, and the entire economy goes under, right? So coming back to my UBI issue, in my opinion, it's not a question about whether we should. It's just a question about how we do it in a way that's sustainable and that makes it so that we can do this in perpetuity. Because if people have cash in their pockets, not bailing out like banks or not bailing out airlines and all this other shit, if people have cash in their pockets, they will spend it. And it would keep the economy going, point blank. Here, so we 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 take money out of like government welfare projects, and when I say government welfare, I mean like corporate welfare. Hell yeah, like things like Lockheed Martin projects. Hell yeah, I would be I would be uh, interested in in discussing things like that. But um, first thing is ending thing. I I hate all welfare welfare that goes out <laughs> to people who are like the vicious poor the you know the the ones that people criticize libertarians mm-hmm. they conservatives bat like you know the social welfare programs along with corporate welfare the things that Bernie Sanders criticizes I hate all of it I think it's all really really bad stuff I mean if I think you, stop, you hate it till you need it you know um, you hate it you hate it you hate it till you need you need it but I think a lot of the mentality is for people who accept it is that I pay into it or at least like an unemployment circumstances like i pay into it so i got to get that money back but with like welfare for families that live off with generations of welfare like that's 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 like with generations live off welfare that's not that's that's terrible I yeah think that's i mean ter- it, you well, can't incentivize you can't give people money and let them keep their leisure time at the same time like because you're always going to choose to keep your leisure time over producing yeah look well, most people a lot of people are going to choose like if you have the option to get a thousand dollars working or get a thousand dollars for free. Like, what are you going to do? Okay. I rather keep my leisure time and do something and like read a book or, or like, uh, do one of my hobbies rather than work. Yeah. I mean, look, that, that's, that's an argument to be made. I, I don't share that same, um, outcome as you, but I, I respect the argument. Um, I just don't think it's as prevalent as you would think, you know, personally speaking, you know, I, I, my family had, you know, some hard trouble you know, when I was growing up and we did lift off of social welfare programs. My family too, you know, my so, family too. So like, what, what, what I can say about this is that it just from my experience, cause I know that you've done it too, you know, is that it, it was extremely beneficial in the time that we needed it, you know, and, and I think that, you know, based on my own personal opinion you know i was able to we were able to pull out of it you know i was able to go to college and then eventually make it you know uh get a good job and 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 be able to support myself and and now i happily pay into to to taxes and and social welfare programs because it was super super fucking helpful for me and now what i'm seeing here especially with the passing of this you know uh, uh stimulus is that what's what's clear to me is is what i just said you know you hate it until you need it and now we need it and we're doing it and it, it just begs a question like okay this is a reality for for people all over the country all over the world really but definitely in this country specifically every day even on non-corona days you know and i think that if we are able to as you said you know find a way to pay for it that is sustainable and, and that specifically targets you know uh things like corporate welfare or even shit wind down you know a lot of our foreign escapades that costs a fuck ton of money i mean that's I, corporate welfare yeah exactly so what what i was trying to say is that like i did some back of the envelope ma- math on like the 2020 military budget and i basically said okay if we take just half of one month of <laughs> of that budget just half of one month you know so we get 11 and a half months of this we would be able to pay to give everybody 
a thousand dollars a month for the next six months <laughs> you know um and that's just one half of one month well, good luck telling Lindsey Graham that or Adam Schiff. Yeah, well, he can go. They can that's go both parties. That's both parties yeah, they, don't want to do that. They can equally go fuck themselves, because like it, the thing, the, the, Republicans <laughs> and Democrats, they both universally vote for for increased budgets. Yeah, it's it's insane. It's insane. And uh, you know, we're an anti-war podcast for the most part, and I think you know our listeners would probably agree. It's like you know, we're just senselessly spending money. It's not like we don't have the money. We're we're rich as fuck. Like we're the richest country in the world. You know, and. And if we just got our priorities fucking straight, um, we can totally do this for people. And when the coronavirus is over, you know, we'll go back to the business as usual where, you know, people are like, fuck welfare programs, who cares, yada, yada. Hopefully we, we have a, a more honest and candid conversation about it after this. Um, but then we we will run up into the next pandemic or more likely we'll run up to the next issue, which is, you know, automation that will seriously affect numerous industries at this point especially in like a a virus you know real issue do you think that a company corporation specifically but you know even even smaller companies are going to think about hey i could try and automate people's jobs instead of having people and then if another pandemic hits or something else goes down like this i won't need to worry about paying people and i could stay afloat and i could stay open right this is what business owners are going to be thinking about right now, especially now that they're pressed for cash like this, right? This is going to propel automation and it's going to propel, you know, uh, loss of jobs in, in the far future. Well, not even the far future, in the near, near term future. That is an interesting point you bring up because a lot of companies will be seeking like, all right, um, the CVS down the street from me is almost completely automated. Like there's three people that work there at any given time. And it's, it's a relatively big, uh, pharmacy store and um it's all self-checkout it's all it's, it's almost completely self-checkout um yeah i would imagine that people rather not run the risk of of having a large labor force and invest in technology especially due to um what's going on right now i mean it is going to be cheaper in the long run i agree Right. So, I mean, we but that's gotta, because we think of this that's because now, in, New, you know? in New York City's case, I mean, there is there is a fifteen dollar minimum wage. So, of course, it's going to be cheaper. Right. You know, so so we got to think of that shit. We got to th- solve that problem now. And whether it's you go down that Zoltan model, which I disagree with, frankly, of like leasing federal lands or, you know, we look at cutting corporate welfare or, you know, we go the Bernie model and like, you know, tax the rich or, you know, there's, there's, <laughs> there's like a, there's numerous options and there's probably several options that fall in between all of those options. Right. And I definitely feel very, very positive about the fact that we can come to, hopefully we can use this as an, as a, as a stepping off point, you know, this economic stimulus package as a stepping off point to prove that it's not necessarily a question about whether we should but more a question of how could we get it done in a sustainable way. Dude, this is going to be this is a bailout <clears throat> of the American people this time. Like it's not like last bailout where we just gave it all the banks and nobody went to jail and like, you know, they didn't pay shit back, you know? <laughs> like so and, and it's a bailout because I mean, w- one of the reasons is that it, and, and this sucks, man. Like we're both fortunate for the opportunity to to be working from home right now. So, and like, you know, we don't you know, our our but we lives sim- but are we not. Sim- we're not. Yeah, but we can sympathize, and that's the thing. And I think yeah, more people I, have to I, have I, empathy I do, in that respect. I, I, absolutely. Right, listen, if I was in the shoes of somebody who um, had, who, let's just say, if I worked as a, uh, I don't know, personal trainer or something like that, and I couldn't see my clients because of all the gyms have been shut down. I would absolutely take the money. <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, without a doubt. Bail me out. Bail me out. Right. I mean. Most people, most for most people, politics is 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 a transactional thing. You know, most people aren't rooted in any type of economic philosophy where they have like either a libertarian view on it or a socialist view on economics or or really whatever. Most people are just like, oh, that's going to benefit me. Yeah, I'm going to take that. Like, obviously, I'd be I'd be wanting to get bailed out too if I lost my livelihood due to due to something that was completely out of my like an external driver that was just totally outside of the business operator's control. Yeah, you're going to you're going to want support. I'm just saying like in a perfect world people would have savings to be able to shelter themselves or to to 
in they would have savings. They, in a, a they would have savings that would be able savings. to afloat themselves. <laughs> they they would be able to be afloat. In a perfect world, honestly, the government should have it, the government should be shutting down all pro, like productivity. It should be shouldn't be shutting down these businesses. I think in a perfect world, if we want to get into like my thoughts or just general thoughts on this mass shutdown, I think it is kind of ridiculous that. Every fucking store, every single small business near me has to shut down. And I understand there's a you need to control and contain and what it, what's at risk is not necessarily the average person who's like in their thirties or so or or whatever age. Uh, it's it's the old, the elderly as well as people with with conditions. Even that... more even more poignantly, it's not just the elderly. It's the fact that like okay, let's say you you, you know you get it. And you get it really nasty, but you're definitely going to survive. But maybe for the time being, you actually do have to go to the hospital. You know, we don't have enough hospital beds to to accommodate all the people that could possibly get this. You know, a, a lot of statisticians are saying that this this could spread to you know tens of millions of people in the country, and we can't, we just can't house that. We we don't have the capacity for that. You know, we don't have enough ventilators for the people who are going to need them. We don't have enough medical supplies, like the fucking. Like I read today that um, that uh, uh, I actually don't watch these kinds of shows, but you know those like medical drama TV shows, like ER and shit like that. Like I don't know what a current one is, but you can imagine one, right? Grey's Anatomy. I don't know, whatever. Those companies, uh, those the the production companies are actually donating their face masks and medical gear that they have for the show because hospitals need it, and and there's also a great risk for the healthcare workers. Right, because they have to still go to work, right, and they have to work with the people. They're at the highest risk of getting the disease, so we we just don't even have enough medical people, right? So it's so it, again, if you don't care and you don't think that you're gonna get it, or you don't think that it's gonna kill it's you, it's not a matter. I don't. It's most it, people don't care. Like that's not. I think that's kind of like a projection. I don't. Most people under understand what the situation is that it's not necessarily that that they are at risk it's not even necessarily their children thank god it's not necessarily that children are at risk because typically with plagues or really dangerous plagues they they target discriminately against elderly as well as the young this one we're fortunate not to have a bunch of sick kids which is which is a real real plus uh but most people understand that it's not necessarily them it's their it's their uncle joe or you know or or their Right, but it could it could be them in the sense that like, all right, let's say you don't get coronavirus, but let's say you get into a car accident, right? And you need to go to the hospital. Well, guess what? They're all the beds are taken right now because ninety million people have coronavirus. Like that would fucking suck, you know? What if you're what if you're pregnant and you're about to have a kid, right? And literally the hospital staff is completely strained. That that would totally suck. Right, so so just do your part. Stay fuck home. <laughs> just just suck it up and just watch Netflix and and if you can work from home, bust your ass so that you know people don't view this as a mistake. And uh, if you have the means and the capacity, you know. I I will say this though. Th- this just one last thing. The the suffering, the economic suffering that's going to take place is going to be far greater than the the actual disease. Right. In the future, for the average the average person, right. not just America, pretty much everywhere, like yep. every every between the U.S. and Europe, both countries are going through the same thing right now. But the economic suffering is going to be more devastating than the virus itself. Yep, totally agree with that. All right, you want to talk about some other random articles that I found? Um, yeah, we said we were we weren't going to talk about coronavirus. <laughs> and of course, we fucking we, did. We, of course, there was no way not to talk about it so all right all right, how all right about we talked about kim jong un <laughs> no we're we're over him we're, we're done we're done with with old kim i want to talk about putin for a second so you remember um we did that um episode a little while back on putin who we were talking about those uh, uh reforms that he was doing to the constitution and like we read through them and we we're like hey well that doesn't sound so bad wow you're limiting the t- uh the presidential term uh limit you are giving more power to you know, basically what their uh, what their version of the House and the Senate is. Uh, and we were like, well, what's his angle here? Like, why is he doing this? Like, you know, how is he going to try to weasel his way into, you know, being president for life or whatever? Um, and I think that reared its ugly head uh, very recently. So 
uh, Russia's parliament actually offered a path uh, last Tuesday um, for Putin to stay in power for an additional 12 years after his term expires in 2024, um, after approving an amendment that would reset his presidential terms. So uh, let, let me be clear. Putin uh, made these suggestions for a new constitutional amendment among many of them, one of them was that he limit uh, uh, to two six-year terms, right? Limit presidents to two six-year terms. And he's already done that, right? He's done more than that, actually. He was, like, president for 12 years, and then he took, like, a six-year break, and he became the prime minister, and then he became president again because there was a loophole. It said just two consecutive terms, not two total terms. So he put these new uh, amendments in place uh, that were sweepingly approved. But that now what they're saying is that once this goes into effect, it basically zeroes out his presidential term. So he starts with tabula rasa. So he can, he can run again and he can do an additional 12 years if he wins both. Um, and I found that pretty interesting because he's 67 years old. He's been in power for uh, a little over 20 years. Uh, and if he pulls this off, he'll be in his 80s <laughs> uh, by the time he's done. And who knows what will happen by then. It's probably a, fa- it's probably a fail-safe if he can't find a, g- a good successor. I don't think he's found a successor yet. That's the thing. Um, the guy before, um, the guy, I forget his name, he was grooming somebody. Apparently he was grooming someone to be a successor, but he he ended up not really liking him that much. And he... Um, he, he kind of he, he fired him, but I don't think I don't think he's necessarily found somebody who is like okay this will be the person to to give to give out uh to hand my power over to because most likely the, the person who is the, the the following president of of Russia is going to be someone who's connected or has a good relationship with Vladimir Putin. Well, absolutely, absolutely, without a doubt. But also, it was will, like they'll, they'll have to be an endorsement in place. Yeah, but there was also uh, like some ideas in place about him, Putin. That is uh, becoming like a uh, like an elder statesman, you know, that served on like a super advisory board and basically would have uh, like a whole lot of sway and a whole lot of power in, in the government still without actually holding the presidentship. Um, so. You know, he wants to keep his options open. Definitely, he's a guy who likes to have as many options as possible, so he can he can kind of circumvent and navigate to different political consequences and possibilities. So I'm sure that he is just this. This is a move to keep the pot. The the, the it, this is something that he wants to have as a failsafe. However, uh, at that age, I don't think he's necessarily going to want to continue ruling like. I think an elder state's role would probably be more appealing to him, right? I don't know. Um, but, I mean, we discussed this in, in that podcast. You know, I, I actually don't think it's safe for him not to be in the government right now. You know, he's he's made a lot of enemies, you know, and he very well might, he could possibly He'll still be, be in the government. Yeah. As an elder state. He's going to need the protection of, of the... He's still, he's still <laughs> going to have government. a security team and a, he's still going to be government. He's just not going to have the title as president. Yep. But, you know, that that's an interesting kind of um, uh, conclusion to that question that I had when when we did that episode, because it was it was interesting, man. When we when we were reading it, they a lot of the reforms that they had sounded very reasonable. <laughs> and I was like, why am I agreeing with Putin right now? <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it sounds like he he gets a, a reset button if and right now they have to they have to still pass it. So they uh have a nationwide vote on april 22nd but god knows if that even happens uh because of the coronavirus nonsense um but evidently russia's been really low on the coronavirus front so who knows maybe it'll happen maybe it won't i don't know why do you think they're low on that Uh, i think they might be lying uh honestly um they just reported recently their first confirmed cases and deaths um, but it's super super low i think they just might be lying about it that, or maybe that's, that's my only opinion. <laughs> may, maybe it's because of, I'm speculating right now, but a lot of Russian cities are pretty far apart from each other. There's not. Mm, there's not. Yeah, but they. It doesn't matter. Once travel. it gets to one, once it gets to one, it'll spread like wildfire. You know. So and, and they do have some very populous cities. You know, Saint Petersburg, Moscow, obviously. You know, the, if coronavirus even touches any of these places, you know, it'll be like it'll be like Brooklyn. <laughs> you know, it'll be like New York City. How quickly it'll spread. 
Well, what is their what are what is their like current like border uh, policy right now? Like, are they? Are they I, I don't know, but they, border? Uh, I, I'm, I'm not 100 percent sure. I can't really speak to that, but I can say that they have very strong trade relations with China, which is the epicenter. So you know, um, people move around. Yeah, um, that is interesting. I don't think they're necessarily lying. I, you, you have to still. I, a lot of people just haven't been tested. That's the thing. Like, if people are not being tested, then you can't have a confirmed case. Yeah. Yeah, but, you know, at the same time, if a thousand people end up going to the hospital with coronavirus-like symptoms, you know, then with even without a test, you can probably make the assumption that it's coronavirus, you know. Uh, just, um, I think, maybe they're doing a little bit of, like, suppressing. Obviously, their, their news media isn't necessarily the most free and fair, you know. So it's possible that they're suppressing it or lying or, I don't know. Who knows? Who who knows? Um, all right. So what's another story that we can we can we can pivot to? Um, how about this one? Uh, so, uh, slightly related to coronavirus, um, but uh, some Americans held overseas in Iran and Lebanon are, are being freed. Um, so some some American prisoners over there are being freed. So the, the Trump administration uh, they announced on Thursday that two Americans uh, imprisoned overseas uh, are. And, and they're going for a third one, um, you know, are, are probably going to be released um, because of the coronavirus, right? So, you know, with these prisoner situations, uh, it is in both countries' best interest that those prisoners don't die, right? Um, because on the one hand, you know, for like, say, Iran, right? Uh, if they're holding one of our prisoners, that's their bargaining chip, Right. That's how they can press us for, you know, they can trade us a, a prisoner for some economic relief, perhaps, right? And if that person dies, well, then there goes your economic relief, right? And on the other side, on the U.S. side, if someone dies, that puts a lot of pressure on the United States military or just the United States in general to do something about that, right? That's, you know, abhorrent that, you know, under their custody, one of our citizens had had died, right? So for both sides, it's, it's in the best interest you know, to make sure that nobody dies. And, and in this case, uh, it looks like they're going to be releasing some prisoners. There's one in particular I found pretty interesting. His name is Michael R. White. He's a U.S. Navy veteran and cancer patient. Uh, and he was released uh, from an Iranian prison. Uh, and he had been there uh, since July 2018. Um, so, uh, you know, big reason for this was that uh, he is a cancer patient, right? So he's at a super, super, super high risk. Um, for, you know, uh, uh, the coronavirus, obviously. And, uh, I mean, at, as it stood already, he needed treatment for his cancer. Um, so I think they, they kind of just like released him for that, uh, reason. But right now, um, he's in a, uh, uh, he's in the Swiss embassy, uh, uh, in Tehran, uh, and he's undergoing some medical testing and evaluation before they, before they cut him loose. And the U.S. just actually announced new sanctions on Iran. Yeah, yeah, they're they're pressuring them. Mm -hmm. it, it's kind of funny because, like, you would think that. So it comes to a point where you're like, how many more sanctions can they actually put on them? And a lot of these sanctions are. A lot of these sanctions are are kind of showing their effect in Iran's inability to really cope with this disease. Absolutely. Yeah. And there's been a lot of questions um, circulating about Iran, the United States um, sanctions of Iran, um, because, you know, there, there are questions specifically around, like, how does that impact uh, Iran's access to medicines, um, medical equipment, you know, things that they would need uh, under this, what in Iran is a is a crisis, is a humanitarian crisis right now. Um you know, so, you know, there are a lot of questions in it and it makes you wonder like, all right, nobody likes Iran, but, you know, maybe we should chill out for a second while they sort their shit out over there, you know? Um, well, sanctions don't harm the government. They harm the people. Right. For, for Yeah, that's exactly why I'm saying this, you know, it, and the even, people are the ones that have the coronavirus, you know? And it's sanctions are so counterproductive. They only the only thing that they really do is that they 
They kill people. They kill civilians. It's terrorism. Sanctions are terrorism. The Iraqi sanction, the sanction that the U.S. put on Iraq throughout the 90s killed, at the very least, 500,000 children. And that is a very, very mild estimate. It killed hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people. In some cases, and some people estimate a million people. They killed a tremendous amount of people due to lack of medical supplies. Like, that was the reason why all these kids died. And in the Middle East, it's very easy to kill kids, unfortunately, because the population is kids. Like, that's it's, the Middle East is an incredibly young population, meaning that at that time, many of those, it, it was the majority of the civilians were were children were, were were younger than the age of i believe 20 at that time so in the early 90s yeah the, most of most of the people were younger than 20 years old so the u.s sanctions were directly responsible in killing kids in iraq hundreds and thousands of kids in iraq and they're just a form of it, it's just a form of terrorism just n- like not freezing overseas assets and and forbidding trade relationships, forbidding like uh, forbidding preventing medical supplies from going into a country, just shutting down all economic activity. It's not a, it empowers the government because then you have the government. If you have an antagonistic relationship with another government and they're putting sanctions on you, then okay, now you have a scapegoat for the problems that you're that is going on in your country. So now instead of Iran blaming their own system they can go ahead and they can blame the countries that are putting sanctions on them right well speaking about that uh, i read an article on foreignpolicy.com that seems to suggest that uh there's already propaganda going around in iran about who's to blame for the coronavirus and can you guess who that might be (laughs) the the u.s and israel (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah totally uh evidently they're they're starting to ramp up their propaganda a lot of a lot of middle easterners think that Mm -hmm, mm-hmm mm-hmm yeah, they so they're ramping up their propaganda, and you know, just to kind of confirm, like they have over seventeen thousand cases and you know, uh, eleven hundred deaths. Um, but you know, a lot of people are saying that it's probably a lot higher uh, because they're just not able to test. You know? So, what are are they saying that the U.S. and Israel created coronavirus to inflict damage on on the people of the Middle East, or are they saying like? The spread is because of the U.S. and the Middle East, because there's some truth to that part. The second part, <laughs> yeah, there's some yeah. truth. There's some truth to the, the sanctions, but like as far as as the United States or Israel creating the virus to infect, you know, Arab and Persian people or just any Middle Easterner, no, that's 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 I, I highly doubt that uh, that. They, <laughs> I mean, I didn't that see they, any... that that they prevent they they did it, but. I didn't see any direct quotes on the, on that article that I read, uh, you know, of propaganda. Um, but I imagine it, they're doing both. You know, they're saying both. Both, you know, these economic sanctions that the U.S. Uh, is imposing on us is killing people. But also, probably, uh, you know, they're saying that the United States and Israel were responsible for them getting it in the first place. I, I, I couldn't, I wouldn't. I wouldn't even bat an eye at that. Yeah, I think that that sounds like something they would say. Well, you can't even blame them for for coming to that conclusion because in some in some way they're they're forced to their primary trading partners, at least in Iran, are is China. They're forced to do that because of sanctions. So they put themselves at greater exposure to Corona because of the sanctions that were put in place in the first place. So it's not a far stretch from the truth to blame Western sanctions on a lot of the problems that they're having right now. And as far as just the high death toll that they're having right now, absolutely, you can you can equate that to sanctions. Like sanctions make the life of people miserable. Like there is nothing that good comes from sanctions. That's why I don't support BDS because I don't support sanctions. Like. Um, it, it's it's not targeting the government. It's targeting the civilian population. It's fucking murder, and um, you shouldn't support those policies. Like, there, it's it. All it does is inflames the spirit of the people of that country to, to hate your country. Like, what do you think happened when the U.S. put I sanctions on Iraq 
and then Madeline Albright said that the price was worth it when she was confronted on 60 Minutes. They said, over 500,000 children have died. Do you think the price is worth it? Madeline Albright said, yes, the pri- we think the price was worth it. Yes, we think the price is worth it. What do you think was played on Arab tel- uh, media? Like, what, what, did, what was played on the Arab media throughout the entire 90s, which is still played on and still everyone remembers to this day? Madeline Albright saying... Yeah, it was totally worth the sanctions of killing these kids and having all these deaths that were totally preventable were totally worth our 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 sanctions that we intense sanctions, our geopolitical interest with Saddam Hussein at the time who was writing a romance novel. <laughs> yeah, that's what he was doing at that time. He was writing a romance novel in the nineties. It's fucking r- ridiculous and. I I just don't. Mike Pompeo, I heard he blamed Iran. He was like, Iran, I forget the exact quote he said, but he put blame on Iran for the spread of Corona. He said, I think he called him an accomplice to Corona. It's a fucking fat piece of shit. But every single opportunity that he gets, they come. And, and listen, man, Iran sucks. Like, Iran is not a good. The government in Iran sucks, man. They basically have Sharia law. Um, not a place I'd ever want to live in. However, I think that there would be a natural revolution there if there weren't these intense sanctions. And the sanctions just give life support to the Ayatollah. And it's just, it's just so stupid. It's so dumb. It's so dumb, like the Washington foreign policy views and, and how they think that these things are, are productive in their manner. Like, oh, occupying the Middle East is going to be totally – is totally going to make people love us. Like, the people who make our the American foreign policy are straight up it, – it's like – it's totally like the book 1984 where the worst propaganda is sir, it is – is saved for the the people in the highest positions, the people who are the, 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 the DMs. Um, I just don't understand how you can come to that conclusion that sanctions and and preventing access of trade to civilian populations uh, is a moral and good policy. It's just it's fucking it's I don't know where the logic I don't know where I don't know where the logic comes from. You're better off you're better off making that decision to bomb and strike Tehran and remove the government that way and just make a swift. A swift and strategic bombing a tactical campaign where we strike. take out tactical strike, surgical strike, tactical, sur- surgical strikes. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that wouldn't work either because whenever you remove a, whenever you remove somebody from power, it always results in a civil war and the following. Right. So and then you some have other to occupy the country. Power, right? <laughs> yeah, some other crazy takes power, or you have to occupy. The belief that people are are ready to to. Uh, capitulate with an occupier is madness it's totally madness so i i'll i'll stop with that rant right now but it's it's madness to think that someone's like oh yeah i love white christians from from tennessee and alabama bama occupying uh uh pushing me at a checkpoint right near my local mosque and uh they just uh push my the fruit vendor down the street and uh yeah this is this is totally awesome they're totally just they're give the freedom is orgasmic they just called me they just called me a motherfucker today that's great <laughs> like well see uh speaking of that um my next thing that i was looking at was you know you might have missed because of the coronavirus stuff that you know there have been some bombings uh some artillery and rocket attacks in iraq uh on mil- on us military bases um, and, you know, to just kind of recap on a bunch of stuff that had been happening over the last few months, you know, uh, Iraq's parliament had voted, you know, to, you know, basically tell the U S to leave, even though that's, <laughs> that's not going to make us leave. And, uh, you know, uh, I always get this, uh, what is the name of, um, Kataib Hezbollah? Khatib Hezbollah. Yeah. Okay, so Khatib Hezbollah had been launching attacks against, um, you know, the United States uh, military bases, uh, which in turn kind of sparked a, you know, some mini conflicts there. And you got to go back. We got to go back for new listeners because we've been covering this story. So we got to go back to the whole embassy thing and the initial you wanna, attack. You want to give a killed. quick rundown? 
Yeah, so back a couple months ago, there was a strike that killed an American, allegedly by uh, Khatib Hezbollah, and the American that was killed, yeah, the the American that was killed was a translator who had been American for about three weeks at that time. And uh, the response was that the U.S. bombed and they killed members of the PMU and I and Shia Iraqi militia forces that were linked to Iran because any Shia is Iranian by the definition of the people who are making policy decisions in Washington. If you're Shia, you're Iran. Same thing. There's nothing that separates the two. If you are a Shia, if you, if you have a if you are not a Sunni Muslim and you are a Muslim, then that means that you're. Any anything that you do that is negative in the world automatically um, makes it an Iran's fault. It would be like blaming, um, like all, like anything that a Catholic does on like a highly Catholic the, uh, concentrated area in the U.S. Like it's just so ridiculous. So, first of all, it was alleged. There was no proof that Khatib Hezbollah even did this attack. The chances are it was ISIS who did this attack, who killed this this. Um, but American I thought ISIS was dead, Henry. I thought we defeated ISIS, them. One hundred percent. There's still the ideological. <laughs> there's not. It's not even worth it to go down and study the different groups of Al Nusra and ISIS and Al Qaeda and the branches that split up and all of that because they're so they. The way it works on the ground there is that. Things change so quickly, and there's so much division. They're, they're not centralized groups. They're, they fly under banners at times. They change banners. They change oaths. They 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 merge groups. Like it's it's not even worth it. But someone claims that it was, it was ISIS, and uh, I mean, there's speculation that there is that ISIS is the one that did the attack. Nevertheless, though, um, the U.S. responded by by killing about 20 or so. Um, I forget the exact number. The 20 or so um, I, Iraqi Shia militias uh, troops, and in response, they attacked the U.S. embassy. And attack is not a good word for it. They did. They rioted at the embassy. I right. think that's a fair assessment <laughs> right. of what they did. No one was hurt. It was a very scary situation. They did where burn some shit, but that's they about burned it. some stuff. They burned American flags and all that. You know. Kind of like the normal mo, uh, Middle Eastern protests at an embassy. At you know, at the same time, Iraqi protesters or t- about two weeks prior, they did the same thing in an Iranian embassy. They burned an Iranian flag, mm-hmm. but this was a direct response. These were loyalists to Khatib Hezbollah who attacked the embassy, and they um, no one was harmed, but it was it was chilling, and I'm sure it was very chilling for the people who were serving there at the time at that embassy. Yeah, it was pretty scary looking. Um, yeah, it was scary, and it, situations like that, I understand that anything could happen, and you're fearing for your life. Right, they're so probably thinking sure Benghazi 2.0. You know? Yeah, I I completely understand. You could think Benghazi 2.0, but no one did die. No American did die. So the response from that was the U.S. killed uh, Soleimani. <laughs> A top Iranian general, and the pretext of that entire thing was that Soleimani was planning an attack on embassies. He was planning an attack on 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 multiple U.S. embassies, and that's why they had to take him down. Well, that ended up falling. That that narrative was was uh, folded like a house of cards, mainly because it was made up. It was not true. He right. was there was no there was no it, they, they weren't was no planning on attack, attacking right. an embassy, mm-hmm. and. When Trump briefed the, uh, when they were briefing members of the Armed Service Committee, they were like, "What the f- like? Are you kidding me? Like this? This is the worst briefing." I think Mike I Lee said it was the worst. <laughs> Mike Lee, Mike Lee said it was the worst security briefing of all time he's ever been been through. Mike Lee, a Republican, he said it was the worst security briefing of all time. So they made it up. They're like, okay, we're gonna we're gonna kill Soleimani right now. We have the opportunity. We're just gonna kill him. So they killed him. Um, Iran responded by shooting some missiles into some helicopter hangars at multiple bases. And um, since then, there's been kind of a tick for tack. Now, I guess what the claim is, and I'm not 100 percent up to date on this story. I've been kind of just casually following it. Um, even though I should be following it more intensely because we do a podcast on this stuff. 
But uh, I guess the claim is that uh, Khatib Hezbollah did fire another attack, killing multiple American troops. Yeah, more, more than one, actually. More more than one. And, this one, and not new American troops, right. not new guys they just made American three weeks prior. Mm-hmm. Sorry to sound facetious in that manner, yeah, I mean, but since I mean, since October, the there's been at least 25 rocket attacks on on bases here, um, and what we're now finding out is the um, U.S. Army is now pulling out of um, uh, three key military sites, uh, one of them Al Qaim and two others, um, and uh, obviously it's looking you know, the U- it's looking like the U.S. is is trying to draw down the presence there uh i wouldn't go so far as to say pulling out entirely <laughs> um there's still going to be people there um but uh you know basically they're not going to be able to operate on the uh on the syrian border in iraq well um, yeah well let, let me let me just add one more thing so the the group that is claiming to have done the attack is called the league of revolutionaries so Iran? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, of course Iran by 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 definition. So the League of Revolutionaries. I have never heard of the League of Revolutionaries before. And um you know, I'm no I'm no expert on these militia groups in the Middle East, but I've never I, I know most of the major players. Never heard of the League of Revolutionaries before. Um, so that's who claims to have done the attack, and I I do not know their connection to Hezbollah or Iran or whatever. But they're the ones who who, who have said they're doing it. But you know, here's the thing: if they're Shia, if they if they are Shia and not Sunni, therefore they are Iran. Let's just it's simple. Let's simplify it like that. Mm-hmm. Like anything that a Shia does, if a Shia Muslim spits on a curb. Or litters. I ran littered right. on your on your street. According to the U.S. Uh, according to policy. Brian Hook, <laughs> according to the Mike Pompeo, right. according to, according to people Netanyahu. who are advising Donald Trump on on his foreign policy decisions, which is, you know, God, unfortunate. He has some bad, he, has some, he has some pretty bad advisors in there, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. say to say the least. I thought we were looking at good at 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 a, a new wave. But I guess my optimism got the best of me when John Bolton was fired, which he should have been fired in a way more embarrassing manner. John Bolton should have been fired, and he should have been forced. His stuff should have been th- thrown on the White House lawn, on the grass, and every single major news outlet, CNN, MSNBC, Fox, yeah, every news outlet in the world just films it. Just John Bolton's picking up his shit and getting fired just in the public eye. I would have loved that. And then all of a sudden his toupee falls off. I don't know if he has a toupee or not, but I like to imagine for this circumstance that his toupee flies off <laughs> in the as wind. he's picking yeah. up all his shit and putting it in a box and he is crying. <laughs> that's that's what I would have loved to see, the fire, the sacking of John Bolton. Well, I mean, and I hope that sacking takes place with Mike Pompeo. I thought for a while that Mike Pompeo was on the rocks. I don't think he – I think he's staying for now. Trump needs that coalition of – of like every Republican in in the United States for this election. Well, so here, I don't here's think a good he's here's a good option. Soon. Here's a good option. How about uh, we make all of those shitty advisors uh, have to work from home, and hopefully they're the lazy assholes that think that they're just on a vacation, and uh, then nobody can. Why don't we experiment that? them with? Well, I heard there's trials for Corona. You know, some of these guys could be can can experiment. And they can really service our country by experimenting with strange and weird diseases, right? Mm, <laughs> Ted, I'm not Ted, Ted, hey, Ted, hey, Ted, Ted Cruz is quarantining himself. <laughs> <laughs> he should, with those weird eyebrows, I'm pretty sure they would deter any type of uh, inf- weird disease that would come his way, right? Danny. <laughs> And he's just like, I don't want to expand. I don't want to expand. <laughs> add any and add anything to this. Oh, it's cor- I had a couple of beers during this during this podcast. I'm not gonna <laughs> lie. Oh, I have a new game to play. What's your game? So I've been Corona ing people. Oh, uh, what does that mean? So have you ever been iced before? Oh, I see where you're going here. Yeah, yeah, I've been iced, unfortunately. So I've been doing it with Coronas. So I got a so during the the shopping spree of uh you know 
when everyone was fighting each other to the death for that last roll of uh, the last box of tampons. Everyone, <laughs> everyone was. I was like, come huh, Corona. There's a bunch of Corona right here. So I got a bunch of Corona, and I've been ice. I've been Coronaing people. So I've been hiding them around my apartment. Like the big Coronas places. or the Coronitas, yeah, the little ones. I, I have a. It's the twelve ounce bottle Corona lights. So not the fancy schmancy ones, just the regular Corona that you drink on Cinco de Mayo. And I've been putting them around my apartment. So um, basically, if you open up a drawer and the Corona is there, you got Corona. And you have to drink the Corona at that time. Do you have to so, do it on one knee? Yeah, you have to, yeah. It's a, whole, it's a whole. It's ice, but with Corona. That's the game. Mm-hmm. So um, there are many Coronas hidden around my apartment, <laughs> and basically, my girlfriend's been Coronaed like five times already. <laughs> um, my roommate's been Coronaed a couple times. Um, have you been Coronaed, or is it because no you're one's Coronaed it? me yet? That's mm-hmm. because I expect it at every corner. Mm-hmm. So you just don't, don't look anywhere. Every single time, every single time I open, I think it's most because people aren't enjoying the game and they don't want me to continue. Yeah. And they know if I get Corona, I'll respond. <laughs> I'll respond with like Corona mean everything in the apartment. Yeah. So like you will not be safe no matter what. Like if you open up a drawer, if you if you just you'll be at your desk working on your computer, you'll go into your your uh, your desk drawer and it, you'll be Corona. Right. Like, you you open up the you had just toilet at, lid and, and suddenly <laughs> yeah, Corona. Yeah, you're Corona. That's <laughs> that's the that's the uh, response I would I would uh, I would have if I got Corona. It would be it would be massive. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm drinking fire a Corona. And fury like the world has never seen. <laughs> I took one. I took some out of my stock, my weapon stock. So I uh, now I'm holding. A corona and I'm drinking it. Well, I, I read a, a study that uh, 36% of Americans don't want to drink Corona beer because they think it's somehow related to the coronavirus, which is fucking stupid. So good on you for supporting, you know, good old Corona and and purchasing their beer. Hey, I love Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> I love Mexico. Um. Yeah. All right. What are some other stories? What else is going on in the world? Um, All right. Yeah. So Iraq military bases, they're they're pulling out. Yeah. Revolutionary, the League of the League of Revolutions, or you know, who cares at this moment about a new militia group that pops out of this desperate country that's been at war for many many years? Um, hopefully that it's just a fact that you know the u.s pulled out of some war game operations with the eu eu how is this a priority right now like here we'll, let's look at the priorities I, I, obviously it's good that they they um they um stopped they didn't go through with the war games which are expensive and i don't really see what the product the how it's productive i guess what deterring russia is that what the war game is about that's we got to deter like Russia that, from yeah. deter deter the red threat from marching all the way to Paris. Remember that that used to be a legitimate fear back in the day. Yep. Yep. They're going to march all the way to the Paris, and everyone's going to be on bread lines for the rest of humanity, <laughs> and they'll then cross the Atlantic and invade New York. Like that's a, like, like going a story the long way. Old... They should just go through like. The Bering Strait. <laughs> if they really wanted to come to us, you know. Yeah, they probably could do that, but I think that if they, they're, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the Soviet plan would be to, to conquer the United States. I'm sure there are plans, right? There has to be some. There has to be some hypothetical plan of, thought of, course, of by a Russian officer. Of course there is. Of like Just how the same we way that spread we... the revolution to North America. Yeah, I mean, of course. And we probably have that same plan for them. Of but course. a lot of, I feel like a lot of those plans that you come out, like you'll see it on the internet will pop up and it'll be like the secret plan to, in, for the secret German plan to invade the United States. And <laughs> you'll be shocked by number five. <laughs> You ever see those like uh, shitty articles, like the clickbait articles that are at the bottom of like regular articles? That's like you have to click a thousand times to get to the actual story. You ever see those? Yeah, basically, uh, yeah, those are the the 
it's like they'll they'll show like a really really hideous looking person yeah. and they'll be like you won't believe what she looks like now right. <laughs> like <laughs> exactly it's like one of those except for like you won't believe Russia's new plan to take over the United States step number 5 will make you go insane <laughs> yeah i know <laughs> it's uh you you won't be, you won't believe Russia's insane plan to take over the United States yeah i'm sure there's hypothetical like there's hypothetical operations that go on all the time in military circles. Like, how would we do it if it came if it came down to it? I mean, it'd be almost stupid not to have those hypothetical yeah, situations. Yeah, like you would have to you would have to have a plan to do it. But to think that that was like a doctrine that was dictating policy decisions is <laughs> nuts. <Yeah>. Like that <laughs> that was never going to happen. Where they're like once where one like there was no mind like mind conf was like a serious doctrine that actually tr- they tried to impl- that Hitler tried to implement. Like if you Mein Kampf, they they, they tried to implement that mm-hmm. in Russia. Mm-hmm. They mm-hmm. they literally said we need to kill the people in Russia to make way for Germans. Right. Like we need more land to become a great Lebensraum country. Lebensraum is the word you're looking for. Lebensraum. Lebensraum. That would actually became policy. But like these. Like these random like theory theories that you think that you hear about, like oh, like Germans pl- Germany's plan to to win the war and invade New York City, like that would ever happen? Yeah, Jesus, like Japan, like the that show that's on Netflix, Castle. What, what is it no, called? It's Man on in the Amazon. High Castle. Yeah, it's on Amazon. It's Man in the High Castle, and it's fucking awesome. Really, is good. Yeah, I really liked it. Well, sorry for shitting on it prior to me ever watching it. it is, it's and awesome. not even getting the name right. But the notion that Japan and Germany would invade the United States and be successful is laughable. Is there is there theory that they came up with the nuke first and they held the U.S. hostage? No, that was the uh, that was uh, the Germans. So spo- hashtag spoiler alert: uh, the Germans actually uh, developed the bomb first uh, and bombed the shit out of D.C. Uh, and then we gave up. Um, and since the Japan Japanese were aligned with them, you know, they use that as a spring off point to capture the West coast. So it's like the West coast is J- Japanese, uh, territory. The East coast is, um, uh, German territory. And there's like this strip in the middle around the Rockies that is just like neutral territory between the two. But the joke that you, uh, point out about the Japanese actually coming over and conquering, you know, um, the, the West coast or anything like that, um, actually plays out to be a bit true right so they're having trouble just like you know with logistics and resources and stuff like that and they're not nearly as advanced as the germans and they know that the germans will probably turn on them at some point so they're trying to get their hands on the bomb as well you know so exactly what you think would happen happens so what what happens uh yeah it's i'm not gonna go into that because you should watch it i promise you it's fascinating it gets a little bit fantastical but i promise it is super interesting and i just love just watching it to to see like that uh alt history kind of feel like you know new york city's all nazied out and shit and like little american kids are going to school hiling hitler and shit and like on the west coast it's like all this imperial japanese control and like the yakuza are a big part of like you know the you know los angeles and san francisco and shit it's actually really it's really well done man uh you should watch it well, you know that there was a – back in, like, the 40s, there was propaganda that was issued out in the U.S. about Japan's own version of Mein Kampf, that their – the plan was that Germany's – Germany – I mean, exactly how the show played out, where Germany was going to invade the East, Japan was going to invade the West, and it, what was going on with Imperial Japan was part of a grand strategy to – to really just control the entire Pacific Ocean and conquer the West Coast of, of America. And that was propaganda that was put out. And it was, like, labeled, it was, like, hashtagged as, like, the Japanese Mein Kampf. And that it was complete bullshit. Like, the Japanese never had any type of intention to invade mainland America. They were, they were barely holding on to their imperial possessions during World War II. Like, that's why the war started in the first place is because they were barely holding on to their imperial possessions that they had gained over the past couple of decades. And they were trying to keep the reason why they attacked the United States is because the U.S. put an oil embargo on them. The fact that 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 was like 
kind of it was like a pseudo intellectual uh, movement that was pushed out to to really just to to scare people. You know, <laughs> you ever see the old World War II propaganda, like the U.S. propaganda? There's so much propaganda. It's like it's so transparently racist it's like you can't just help but laugh it will just go through all the japanese stereotypes of like them having huge teeth and squinty eyes and it's just man at a diff- this this was a different time like, this this was this is wartime this was this is real wartime people always are like oh there's new age there's like Oh, there's so much propaganda going on right now, man. Like propaganda has existed since we were, since ever. There's always been propaganda. There's always been neocons. There's been neocons in the Roman, the the you know the 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 Republic of Rome, like the people who wanted the who pushed up the push for the destruction of Carthage. They are Roman neoconservatives. It was the. Um, who was I forget the name of the Roman politician at the end of every single uh, Senate he, Senate meeting or council meeting. This senator got up and he spoke and he said, no matter what topic they were talking about, no matter what they could be talking about a domestic issue or whatever, he said uh, he ended it with I support the sacking and destruction of Carthage. After after this was between the times of the of the second and the third. Um, the third um, Punic War. You ever hear that story? Because, you know, there's three Punic Wars, the first, the second, and the third, and the third one. The second one was the one with, with Hannibal, and Hannibal pretty much came the closest to ever before Rome had, you know, eventually fell to the Visigoths, Hannibal, uh, Didn't you march a bunch Italy of for... elephants across the the Alps? <laughs> the story is really incredible. It's very it's Hannibal is one of the most interesting people in human history. Um, he had he was raised in Spain and he was raised at birth to become a military leader. And a lot of the moves that he made were independent from the government in Carthage. Carthage didn't want that much escalation, but he kind of like was almost a rogue-like general. And what he did is that he was very famous. He was very respected. He recruited a lot of like uh, Gallic and Celtic tribes, and he went around and he and he made the ambitious move. He you know, he he brought elephants from Africa and, and and he traversed the Alps. Like he crossed the Alps with, with elephants, the ground, with <laughs> elephants and ground force. Granted, I, when he got to the other side into Italy, a lot of those elephants died. Right. <laughs> As you can imagine, <laughs> yeah. that an elephant walking through the Alps is most likely going to end up in that elephant's death. Right. Um, so a lot of them died, but for a while they were on, they were in battle. But could you so, imagine that shit? Like you're a Roman soldier, and then suddenly a fucking war elephant. Like most of those people hadn't even seen one, probably even heard of one. And they're just like, now I got to fight this shit? Fuck that. You know? It must have been scary. It must have been terrifying. You've never seen... If you're a Roman soldier at that time, or a Roman citizen, you have never... I bet your ass you have never seen an elephant or, or most exotic animals in your entire life. And what Hannibal did is that a lot of those elephants did die when he got to the other side. Um... And a lot of the soldiers, he lost like almost fifty percent of his, his of his ground forces when he ground forces like there were air forces, right? <laughs> like there was other forces. He lost most of his. He lost a, a big chunk of his uh, his military. But what he did is that he basically went from from place to place and he just sacked, you know, different police forces and villages and lived off the land for 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 many years. And of course, there's that famous battle of uh, Kenef where. Hannibal like flanked like a Roman a Roman legion of like ninety thousand soldiers and he had about twenty thousand soldiers and he encircled them completely and then went through an entire day of uh, of just murder it was just like a day long event of 
just enclosing forces circling onto this massive group of, you know, tens of thousands of men, you know, force that started out was 90,000. I think, I think it was around, you know, who knows with these ancient historians, cause they're the ones who are writing about this and giving us the records, but Romans are Romans were pretty, were known to be pretty good with records. And it was, it was a slaughter fest for a day that went on. And it was just, uh, it's like one of those like extreme moments in history where you're like, man, fuck. Like I would like kind of want, I kind of want to see it. Like I, not because I'm a sick fuck, but just because I want to like, just kind of capture like what it was like back then. Like under, like I want to, I want to understand what that was like. So I think that's like a benchmark as far as like ancient battles and like the magnitude of like how large scale and how violent they were. But, um, yeah, he, he rode around the – Italy had to – Rome basically shut down the government, and they called for a dictator. And uh, eventually they what they did is that they never combated him. They never they, – they knew they wouldn't be able to defeat Hannibal. Um, so they just kind of let him do what he want, and they wouldn't engage large forces – with Hannibal and they, they, they were just kind of hoping that he would eventually just his, his soldiers would die off and, and they would eventually lose steam. And, and eventually they, they did, uh, Hannibal died. I mean, uh, they, they were eventually defeated by, uh, I think Sicero, the Roman general whose grandfather was a, was a military leader. And during the beginning of the war, his, gr- no, his son was a, a leader during the beginning of the war. His father was a, Sicero's father was a military leader, and then he died in battle, and then his son ended up defeating Hannibal. Um, but it's like an epic story. Between that, though, between that was like the World War II generation of Rome. The 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 guys who fought in the Second Punic War. Between that and the Third War, when Rome eventually sacked and destroyed and killed everyone in the entire city, they were like you know, neoconservative Roman movements that were like, Hey, let's push for, let's like, we support the, the, you know, hand up like Car- Carthage, like, like they're in modern day Tunisia. So it was a good location for trade. And when they were defeated the second time, they were, um, you know, they, they quickly gained influence back in that region again. So, Rome was trying to limit or mitigate their influence throughout the rest of the Mediterranean. So they sacked them. They said they sacked them, but I'm forgetting like the exact names of all these Rome, these Roman like politicians who are, who are pushing for it. But I don't know. It's a super interesting moment. And uh, we can do a show about it. Yep. Yeah, we should do a show about it. It's um, it's like a, it's like a, you know, who does a really good topic on it? Dan, Dan Carlin Dan talks Carlin about always it. Always talks about the best things. He picks he picks really interesting topics. He does, um, I or, or he makes topics interesting. But he did a podcast called, um, I think it's I think he just called the Punic Wars. He, it's like a three part series that he does, which is uh, which is really really interesting. But there's plenty of like you, the Punic Wars is like one of the one things in ancient history that you learn about when you're in high school or when you're in ele- or when you're in like middle school. Did you ever learn about the Punic Wars when you were younger? No, <laughs> no, I, no. I didn't. I didn't catch on to this until I was like, I don't know, in college. Really? Yeah, I just went See, to shitty schools, I guess. I, I, so I went to Catholic school, so naturally, <laughs> Look I think we're you. given a better education <laughs> than you public school folk. <laughs> uh, but my social studies t- classes, we talked about the Punic Wars. You didn't ever talked about like ancient history. No, I think we talked about it, like it, you know Greeks and Romans, and they had a bunch of gods, and then like I don't know, maybe the Industrial Revolution, and then World War One, World War Two, and uh, that's it. <laughs> it was, um... and even then, World War One was like, yeah, it was the war, the war before World War Two. <laughs> well. The history classes and I don't know how bad they are and what they teach. I think a lot of it is that kids don't pay attention. 
I think that's a, like a big part of it is that you know they're yeah. reading through the textbook. There's a lot of information in those textbooks, know, but, but they I don't liked actually read them. Social studies, and I I absorbed a lot of that information. Like it's totally possible that I've just you know like I'm blanking it out of my mind, and and maybe I was taught it, but I liked that subject. That was one of my favorites in school. Yeah, that was one of my favorites as well. But then you realize a lot of things that you were taught were kind of there is a narrative on it, right. you know, yeah. or it was whitewashed there, or something like that. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of the history that you learn in, in school is either whitewashed or they're installed memories that contribute to, you know, the nationalism of that country, you know, like you're always going to all, all American wars. And this goes for any, I'm certain this goes for other textbooks in other countries. There's, a certain degree of like romanticizing pretty much all conflicts that 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 uh that your country your nation has been in like in world war one it's always about um the zimmerman telegraph like that's like oh, that's the reason why they entered the war um in world war Two, obviously it's all about pearl harbor and world in vietnam it's all about the vietnam is all about the domino theory that that's like the reason for the war um, the Civil War is all about slavery. Like it's all these wars are just given such simple, simple causes, and there's really no context given to them. So it's like almost like oh, it's like a mantra. Why did the U.S. go to the? Why did the U.S. go into a a, a four year long, bloody, devastating civil war? Uh, because of slavery, which is part of it, but there's a lot more. There's a little, there's many more reasons why the there was a civil war besides slavery. Why did the U.S. go to war with Germany during World War One? Oh, because the Germans were trying to to get Mexico to invade the, the United States. They were they were doing alliance. There's a lot of financial reasons why the U.S. went to war with Germany in World War One. Why did the war? Why did the U.S. go to war during World War Two? Because the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. Well, there was an oil embargo that took place that was crippling the Japanese economy, and they struck. There's a lot of other things that went that took place besides that as well. So the schools don't do a good job. They they just give kind of like a key talking point, like a key justification for the war, but they don't go into like all the political and economic reasons why the war started in the first place. So I think that's like the major problem with school systems when they talk about uh, really just any conflict in general. Um, and there's also like... It, you know, World War Two. When you talk about World War Two, you got to romanticize it, right? It's a romantic. It's a romantic part of American history. Haven't you ever seen Saving Private Ryan or Wind Talkers or Band of Brothers? It's it's one of those things that you should strive to be. One of those one of those poor guys. I don't know. When I saw those movies, when I saw uh, Saving Private Ryan, and seeing that those scenes at, where they're storming the beach of Normandy, and you know, there's there's plenty of like kind of gut wrenching scenes in that where I'm just like war is hell and I hope to never be part of it. <laughs> you know, like this is terrible human suffering. Like I hope to never have to be in these situations ever, and I hope that really no one should be put in these situations. This is hell on earth. Yeah. Like, well, I've, I don't I've got another uh, I got another four years I think before the Selective Service Act can't can't get me anymore. So, uh, yeah, let's just ride it out. <laughs> It's like a reason why I one time shared on the Bro History Facebook page when we first started podcasting this video of a um, – I just found some like some World War II footage and um, it was like some just really like compelling footage of an aircraft carrier. Yeah, um, yeah I remember that. In mm -hmm. combat with some Japanese Zeros and I posted it on my, fa on, uh, my Facebook just because it was interesting to look at. And I had all these people commenting on it like, oh, man, I wish I lived in that generation. I'm like, no, you don't. No, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, don't. <laughs> you know, a lot of those guys died, right? <laughs> like this is this was a very blood. This is bloody combat. Well, I, I'm, I, I want to kick doors down. If I was there, I want to kick. And no, no, you don't. <laughs> I've never I don't. You never meet guys in the military who actually talk about talk like that. Yeah. They're never, uh, they're never like, oh, yeah, I want to kick doors like down. It's always some, or something like that. Yeah, though. maybe one in a hundred. But most guys, most guys in the military are pretty objective when they talk about these things. 
Um, at least the guys who I've come across, they're they're pretty like, yeah, you know, look at the goods and bads of a situation. It's always like the basement dwelling losers who are like, yeah, I've been drinking Red Bull all day and playing Call of Duty. I'm ready to kick some dirt, some doors down in bring my, in Afghanistan. I'm <laughs> like, gonna bring this katana that I bought at the at the borders at the mall. <laughs> to I've been with practicing me. with my nunchucks. <laughs> Taliban, your days are through. <laughs> so many, there's so many like just fuckers. Like if you have to like brag about kicking down doors on the internet, then you're most likely a pussy. <laughs> you're most likely a pussy. <laughs> on that note, <laughs> I think we should wrap this up because we're, we're pushing uh, at this point. Um, but uh, do you have anything else to, to say before we kind of close out? Yeah. Stay safe. Uh this I understand this episode was probably more of a shit show than many of the episodes that we do, but we're we're in unusual times right now, <laughs> so I think that gives us the excuse to be a little bit more um, weird, fun. <laughs> <laughs> I like to think of it as fun, or a little bit more opinionated than like objective. Yeah. I know it's some of you guys hate it when we're opinionated, but you know what? This is an opinion show. We try to be objective on some stuff, but... On most stuff. On most stuff, but, like, you know, we're not doing this show to fucking be objective journalists. We're doing it to talk about our opinions Sh- and stuff. The shit we find interesting, yeah. <laughs> the shit that we find interesting. Um, but if you like the show, rate and review the podcast. Um, five stars is always good. Uh, other announcement as well. So I've been working on... So I've been doing... Since we, you know, there's... I have saved some time to commute at least. We, I have been putting the old audio podcast on YouTube slowly. So some of you guys have reached out to me and said that you – like, why aren't you guys on YouTube? Um, we are on YouTube. We were, we, we were on, on YouTube. YouTube. Yeah. We were on YouTube, um, and we were posting podcasts on there regularly. But we, we kind of like – we we have like about 500 subscribers or so on YouTube and we were getting a lot more downloads on our other a lot uh, a lot more <laughs> a lot more a lot more on like the the other on the audio yeah. so we kind of we concentrated on that just to perfect it um but now I'm kind of playing catch up and I'm posting the old episodes that we did and this is over the past couple of months onto YouTube so it's kind of a good archive if you want to search um, someone told me that they like falling asleep to our podcast. That's, uh, I don't know if that's like a, like a positive thing or a negative. <laughs> it's kind of weird to know that people are falling asleep to our voices, but you know, but the thing is though, is I completely understand where you're coming from. Um, because I do the same thing. i like to fall asleep to podcasts as well. So I'll put on like a Joe Rogan podcast and I'll just fall asleep to it. You know, if it's an interesting thing, like it's relaxing. Um, I'll, so I, I get that. So I'm going to start putting that. And then once I get all of the archives up or all the older episodes on YouTube, then I think we'll start like doing the, the, the YouTube where you can see our faces again, doing the YouTube, um, if doing, doing the YouTube, because I, I, a lot of you guys have told me that like we, we need to get on YouTube and, um, I, I, I get it. I know, I know we're slacking in that regard, but, um, but now that I have some free time, I will I will start catching up on that. So uh, I will give you updates. Subscribe to the channel, uh, the YouTube channel, um, to uh, to get a head start on that if you haven't already. It will be in the description below. And um, be safe out there. Um, don't kill anyone over toilet paper. And um, yeah, stay away from uh, large crowds. Cancel, cancel your Broadway plays that you were going to, well, they, or they've already been canceled, yeah, right? They beat you to it. Oh, they beat us to it. All right, all right, peace. <laughs> <laughs>